Well, good morning. We welcome you to Bay Presbyterian Church in our worship of the living God. It's so good to have you here today. And I don't know if you noticed, but we had a little difference in our music program. We've been trying to keep it under wraps, but now here it is. Um, before they get too far away, I want to introduce you to these young people. Uh, here at first violin is Amanda, and at first violin is Michael, and at first viola is Juju, and on the cello is Judy, first cello. <laughs> They're all first as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and they uh, are, are here on the good graces of Gloria Gully, who's with us again here today to help us uh, with our music. So we thank you. And uh, are you going somewhere? Okay, go to the back. I used to think I was in charge. We know that. Okay, um, today you might have noticed something in the fellowship hall. We have a few tables up, and um, as we said last week, we are going to be having a, a, a box luncheon for uh, today if you signed up. Um, if you didn't sign up, um, I think uh, you have to go to Publix and get your own sandwich and bring it back. Uh, because I think we only got as much as we had orders for. However, if you want to stay for the meeting that follows, I would recommend being back here at 1245, and uh, somewhere around there we'll start the meeting. Uh, it's an information meeting. I mentioned last week we're shuffling some staff assignments. We want, we want you all to be able to hear it and to uh, provide your input and um, help us work through it. And then... Um, since we have, oh, let me tell you how that's going to work. Um, oh, yeah, you, you're going to have to come back, so that we don't have to worry about that. You, you need to come back at about 10 minutes after 12 if you signed up for a box lunch. Uh, 10 after 12 if you signed up for a box lunch, quarter till 1 if you did not. Okay. This is complicated. <laughs> okay, now... Um, the other problem, and Greg, you're probably wanting this uh, issue brought to the fore. Uh, we have a Sunday school that meets for adults um, at, uh, typically it meets at 1010, and it goes for about 40 minutes uh, to 1050, uh, plus or minus. And you may have noticed, Greg, that your Sunday school room is unavailable. And there's a good reason for that. It's because I messed up. So what we're going to do is we're going to have Sunday school. It's going to meet in the fellowship, or not in the fellowship hall, but in the conference room. Uh, and it's going to be first come, first serve, because there are only a certain amount of chairs that are in there. So uh, it's free. OK. Well, um, so I don't want any fist fights outside, uh, trying to get a spot in there. but. Um, I think there's 13 chairs in there, and Greg gets one, so the first 12 uh, will, will be able to sit down, and for the rest of you who don't make it, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, oh, uh, on Thursday afternoons at 2.30, there's a Zoom Bible study that takes place, uh, and uh, they are looking for people who might want to participate in that. So if you want to participate in that, say something to me after the service, and we'll get you all the information you need to participate in that. It's a, it's a, they're doing a harmony of the Gospels. So some stories will, in the Bible are in several Gospels, and they're, they're kind of bringing that out and taking a chronological trip through the Gospels, and they're tying together uh, the stories that are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Occasionally, John, not very much. Um, on the 17th of March, Harry Reader's here, and he's, he's going to be talking about um, leadership lessons from Gettysburg. Am I saying that right, Pastor? Yes. Okay. 
Leadership Lessons from Gettysburg on March the 17th, 6.30, right here. If you are a Civil War aficionado, Harry Reeder is a leading expert in the, in the area. He takes trips and tells people where the different armies were and how, the, how they marched and who was shot and who wasn't. And then the following night, we're having faith in the public square here. Uh, that's going to be at 7 o'clock. That's going to be tricky because on Thursday night at 6.30, Friday it's at 7. Don't get them backwards so, because otherwise you'll be late. Um, now, for Faith in the Public Square, you have in your bulletin a card. It looks very much like this. And so if you're interested in, in coming to that, this is a, a program they do around the country, and uh, Harry will be participating, as will Peter Lilbeck. On the very bottom of the back of that card, it says, visit FIPSBonita.com. It's easy to overlook that. But uh, that is the web address so that you can register online and then, um, and then be here on Thursday. OK. Whew. I hardly ever make mistakes. <laughs> but when I do, they come and Clusters. <laughs> uh, yes, Faith in the Public Square is Friday. Harry Reader is on Thursday. Faith in the Public Square is Friday. Um, and then new members dinner, March the 23rd. The week after that, March the 23rd, 6 p.m. If you're interested in joining or finding out more about our church, we would love to have you uh, come to a dinner we're going to have on the 23rd. And, um, and you sign up. There's a white card in the pew racks in front of you. You can pick one of those out. Write down your name and your contact information, and we'll get in touch with you as to the particulars. And I think that's it. OK, let's take a few moments now to prepare our hearts for, oh, oh one other thing. Dave Tanner is uh, taking pictures. If you have not had your picture taken, or if some of you have had your picture taken, but someone has said to you, we don't have your picture, that's part of the cluster that I have. So uh, please see Dave Tanner. He'll be out front after the service and get your picture taken. And so we can, we're going to start producing these, uh, these uh, directories, pictorial directories, and we want to get that wrapped up. So see Dave afterwards out front here. Let's take a few moments now to prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning, everyone. This morning's call to worship is from the 23rd Psalm, and we all know this. But if you'll join me as we read responsively from the inside front cover of your bulletin. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our first hymn, would you stand with me as we sing together, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
our great God and heavenly Father, we ask you to guide us this day in our worship, O great Jehovah. God, we pray that you would fall on us by your Holy Spirit so that our worship might be rich and the experience of worship might go to our very core. God, we pray that you would be with us, in us, and among us, that our worship might be in spirit and in truth, so that we might leave this place and say, today we have been in the presence of Almighty God. Hear us, O oh God, we make our prayer. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who lived and died and rose again, and who, while on this earth, taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. This is the reading of the word of God. 1 John 2, 15 through 25. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. If the ushers will come forward at this time, we'll continue in our worship as we present to God our tithes and offerings. Would you please bow for prayer with me? Our great God and Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the blessings we enjoy from your hand day in and day out. Our sin, Father, is that we don't acknowledge these and rather we presume that we're responsible uh, for uh, our prosperity. But you said in your scriptures that we just read, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? God. 
we have everything that we need for life and faith. And we thank you for that. And now, God, we thank you for uh, the prosperity we enjoy and pray that you might take these offerings, just a part of what you have given to us, and that you might multiply them and use them to build your church here in Southwest Florida and to the ends of the earth. We pray in the name of Jesus, who is our strong Savior. Amen. Then will you continue in worship as we stand and sing together, what a friend we have in Jesus.
you and please be seated. I would invite you now to take out your prayer sheet from your bulletins and scan down there, pick out two or three for which you would pray. I would, uh, Josiah goes in for surgery this week, so please be remembering Josiah. Uh, yesterday I saw John Kiptik, he's in very, very rough shape. And would appreciate your prayers. And, uh, and Georgia Bolsom, who was supposed to be home uh, earlier this week, is still in Miami. They are waiting for a acute care rehab facility to open up. And uh, right now there's no space. So we need to uh, pray that God would open up a space so that they can get home. Um, so you have these requests, and I'm sure you have many of your own. Why don't, why don't we spend the next few moments in silent prayer, and I'll conclude us in a few moments. Let's go to God in prayer. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we are frail you said in the scriptures that our constitution is like a tent, explicitly temporary, not meant for eternal things. And yet you also said that you went to prepare a mansion for us, something with hardened walls, something that will endure for eternity. And God, we thank you for that great and precious promise. And uh, God, as we live in this world, in these tents that carry around our person, God, we would pray for help. We're reminded this morning of the uh, difficulty that's going on in Ukraine and the lives that are so senselessly being lost. Uh, we pray that you might bring peace to that region. We pray that... Uh, you would uh, calm the anxiety that's creating uh, such a conflict. We pray that uh, for our part, we pray that you give our leaders wisdom to deal wisely and justly in this matter. Heavenly Father, we would want to lift up our men and women who are serving in the armed forces, acknowledging that Theirs is a, is a difficult and dangerous job, and we just pray that you might keep them safe, particularly as the world, so it seems, is on fire. And so grant them uh, safety and success in their missions. We pray the same for our first responders, for our EMTs, for our, our doctors and nurses who are on the front lines of this war against COVID. And it would appear from the CDC statistics that indeed uh, we are getting on top of it, or should I say that you are gaining the victory for us. And uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for intervening and for our apparent uh, emergence from this awful disease. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are in ill health, I think particularly of Josiah, and for Georgia, and for John Kiptik. God, there are, uh, there are many more requests that we have before us. There are many more that are not written down here, but nevertheless felt deeply and painfully by many here today. We pray for those folks, and we pray that you might draw near to them, that they would sense your presence and not know fear, but know peace and calm because uh, the great physician is by their side. And Heavenly Father, we pray for the good ministries with which we're associated, praying for uh, our college ministries. We pray that you would bless them uh, and that you would bring increase to them. 
And uh, God, we would pray for David Shooter as he ministers in uh, Dublin, Ohio. And we pray that that church would prosper. And uh, we pray for David, who's had his bout with illnesses, having a rare cancer and uh, surviving and then having a rather heavy case of COVID and still surviving. God, would you bless his ministry and give him strength every day to get past these um, afflictions so that he might stand strong again. God, we pray for our pastor today as he brings the message and pray that you would encourage our hearts, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to understand. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, good to see all of you, and man, what a blessing to hear this, uh, this beautiful string quartet up here, along with uh, Hearst pianist Gloria over. <laughs> we certainly bring greetings to Gordon and Carol, who I'm sure are watching this morning from North Carolina up in Charlotte, and uh, we miss you and look forward to you being back, but in the meantime, you've left us in good hands, and we appreciate you so very much for that. Also... I want to say hello to my mama, who is in the hospital, Mission Hospital in Asheville, recovering from what was supposed to be just a simple outpatient procedure on Wednesday, but due to complications, she's still there, but getting better. And then, of course, we all stand in solidarity today with our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Ukraine. And I just want you to know that my prayers are that God, by his mighty power, will frustrate, confuse, and otherwise obstruct the plans of the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin, who has chosen to relegate himself to the historical junk heap that contains the likes of Hitler and Stalin. That's what will come of that, sir. And I think about the Presbyterian pastor who was determined to make his way to the church building if it was still standing in Kiev today to preach and to lead in worship if he was able to make it. May God bless that we might take into consideration whatever excuses we use not to come to church on a given Sunday when bombs are not falling and bullets are not flying, that God would grant us that same spirit of determination and faith that we may realize this world is not our home and how grateful we are for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles or otherwise give your attention to the reading of God's Word found in Joshua chapter 23. We go now is our theme that we've been sounding throughout this series and next Sunday will be our last Sunday in this book as we consider together this this time in which the people of God came to enter and occupy the land of promise. How that God, through the transition of leadership between jo from Moses to Joshua, and then now as Joshua begins to transition out, as he is along in years, will be moving on, and God's people will enter a new phase, yet the Lord remains on the throne. And so, the series is We Go Now. It is time for us to go, to do that which God has called us to do. The time is urgent, and God's warning is clear. So let's read together. Joshua chapter 23, beginning with verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes and those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off, from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight, and you shall possess their land, just as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, 
be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations, and as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts up to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and Make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you. Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. And now I am about to go the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given to you. So may the Lord bless this reading of his word. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. This is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. Amen. And so I'm thankful for warnings. I'm thankful that when I was growing up, people pointed out things to me like copperheads and rattlesnakes and told me to stay clear of them, or at least the business end of them. I'm thankful that I learned how to be on the lookout for things like yellow jackets' nests and hornets' nests, which I came to fear much more than copperheads or rattlesnakes. I never will forget when I was using the sickle mower on the tractor, when I was cutting from under the fence row between my papa's place and Uncle Lawrence Winchester's, that just as I glanced back, I saw the sickle mower come under a pretty good sapling that had a hornet's nest about that large in it, and as the sickle was doing its thing, that nest was shaking. And I'm thankful that I had learned how to engage that tractor's gears in a way that got me out of there quickly. Otherwise, I was ready to jump out of the seat and leave that thing behind. On any given day, I would much rather encounter a rattlesnake on a trail in the woods than a hornet's nest. Warnings are useful things because they help us be on the lookout for real danger and consequences to decisions if we make them without regard to those warnings. And what we have in God's word, among other things, are warnings throughout this book that God lovingly gives us. The people who told me about those threats that I might face in the woods or in the pasture told me those things because they were concerned about me. They didn't didn't tell me to be on the lookout for hornet's nests because there was something diabolically wrong with them and their spirit. No, they, they told me about those things because there's real danger. And so God lovingly gives warnings, and I hope that we would realize that. Now, I know sometimes we can be driving along the highway and we'll see signs up that says, you know, repent, the end is near. Or, as I saw on one sign years ago, turn or burn. We don't always know the motives that people have for putting up things like that. But nevertheless, God gives us warnings because he loves us and he cares about us. And so when we come to the book of Joshua, we find a leader who is transitioning from his place of leadership, Joshua, who has faithfully led the people of God through their exploits in the land of promise, now is along in years, and he wants to give them some final words. Now, his final sermon is what we will consider next week. But in the meantime, 
we have something of a final warning here. And among other things that we can discern from this chapter are at least three things. First of all, the passing of time will never diminish the significance of God's word. Even though it has been millennia since God delivered the children of Israel from Egypt and brought them through the wilderness and into the promised land, the glorious work that he accomplished to get them there is not diminished with the passing of time. And even though skeptics have arisen that have caused us to question or doubt or be skeptics ourselves concerning the things of God's word, that doesn't diminish at all what God did in those days. And if we love him, and if we are thankful for him and for our Lord Jesus Christ, we realize that all of these things happen just as God's word declares that they did. And so, we are thankful that these things really did happen. And so, whether you choose to believe that they actually happen or not, doesn't diminish their truthfulness whatsoever. You know? It's, uh, it, it's sort of like... Uh, when you're driving down the, the highway in the mountains and you may encounter a sign, which people have seen through the years, as I've mentioned before, watch for falling rocks. You can choose to ignore that, and you might even choose, see a rock that is falling towards you from up high, coming down toward the road. And you might choose to say, well, I just simply think that rock doesn't exist. I choose to believe that's not happening right now. Well, Whatever may be at the source of that statement, good or bad, will have no effect on that rock whatsoever. Your opinion concerning God's redemptive work in the Old Testament and the New, whether you approve or whether you think it actually happened or not, will not dissipate its reality in the least. We can choose to reject God's word, and we can choose to reject the truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, but that will not prevent you from standing before God on the judgment day and giving an account for your life if you have rejected the Lord Jesus. It will not diminish God's plan whatsoever. He is not in heaven right now frustrated because there are so many people who fail to believe in him. He is not wringing his hands. So the work that he's accomplished is not diminished in any way with the passing of time or by our own unbelief. In verse 9, I'm sorry, in verse 3 of chapter 23, we read, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, for it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. God has done a great thing in establishing his people there. And Joshua rehearses in their hearing just exactly what the Lord has done. We see it also in verse 9 in our scripture passage. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations, and as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. It's good to remember that God has been faithful. It's good to remember and recall in our own lives the experiences that we've had with the Lord in the past and realize that those past experiences have a present ongoing reality and importance in our lives. If you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ years ago, I can tell you here and now that that has an ongoing present reality and importance that the passing of time cannot diminish. And we can all be thankful for that. Over in Acts chapter 20, verses 18 through 21, where the apostle Paul has gathered together the elders of the church in Ephesus to say some parting words to them. He reminds them that, he says, and when... They came to him. Paul said to them, here's what he said. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he doing there? He's reminding them of the work that has been done among them, that as they recall that to mind, they will live by faith in the present and continue to persevere into the future. That's why we need to know our Bibles. 
We need to be aware of what God has done through the ages in his faithfulness toward his people, even when there's been discipline involved. You know, on uh, Wednesday afternoons, we, uh, we, we have a Bible study with uh, some guys from the Peoria, Illinois area. Our, our pastor lovingly refers to them as the Peoria Mafia. And, uh, you know, I dare not miss those meetings when I'm here, since it's a mafia after all. But we've been, uh, as of late, we've been reading through the book of Jeremiah and considering it. And, you know, there's hard stuff in Jeremiah. I mean, it's, it's just tough. It's, there's tough news to face there as God's people have reached the place in Jeremiah because of their rebellion and rejection of him that they experience the consequences of that rejection. And, and it's hard. But still, it's, it's God's word. And we realize that there are lessons from those past declarations and experiences that are relevant in our own situation. That if we choose as a culture to reject the things of God and veer away from his clear teaching and his word, there will be consequences for that in our lives personally and in our culture collectively and particularly within the church as that is where the real application lies. How that in the church... We must be faithful to the true worship of the one true and living God and not reject him. We need to look to the past and realize that God's work is significant and that we will be recalling it in eternity. The Lord worked wonders to rescue his people. He's worked wonders to rescue you. If you know the Lord Jesus today, you're a walking miracle because God, by his grace, has effected in you a new birth. You've been born again. And the evidence of that new birth is that you've trusted in Jesus. Otherwise, you wouldn't have come close to faith in Christ. But you are a walking testimony of God's faithfulness in our generation, not just to past acts of redemption. Secondly, the passing of time will never diminish the importance of God's word. We uh, see that, and you've got verse 14 there in your outline, but I would also just point out verse 6 to you before we get to that. Therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left. There you go. That says it, doesn't it? There's no progressive revelation here, that an idea that has been adopted in many churches today, churches so-called, the idea that, that we can move on from a lot of the things that are in the Bible because God is working in a different way in our own culture. And so the morality of the past is not necessarily, necessarily relevant to our present situation. Chuck Swindoll used to say that there is a, uh, there is a, a technical Greek word for such notion. Hogwash. God's word is relevant and true throughout all generations. And Joshua doesn't tell them, say, all right, now Moses told you some things back then, but now we've reached a different point in our time and culture, and so you can just, you know, be a little looser in your practice. No, God's word is important and true. The passing of time does not diminish it. Verse 14, and now I am about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. What an extraordinary statement. Can you imagine a president giving a State of the Union address or a farewell message to the country at the end of his presidential term and say, not one promise that I uttered in the campaign has failed. We can imagine it, yeah. But it wouldn't be true, would it? it? Hadn't happened. Never happened. But God can say it. God can say everything that I promised has come to pass, just as I said that it would. And so you have to ask yourself today, who are you trusting in? Professors? Politicians? Social media influencers? They all sound good, don't they? They look like they know what they're talking about until they die. And many of them will find that their theology will change in about 0.2 seconds after they breathe their last breath. 
Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. Psalm 119, 89 to 90. Think about that. God's word, forever fixed, established, anchored in the heavens. We've all seen those bumper stickers. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Now, there's a certain confidence in that, but I would suggest to you that those stickers would be truer if they simply said, God said it, that settles it. Now, it's good for you and me if we believe it, but we won't diminish its truthfulness in the slightest if we reject it. We are the one who will be diminished. Do you get what I'm saying? And then the third thing, the passing of time will never diminish the relevance of God's warnings. And they are a plenty. We see that in verses 11 and 13 in our passage, among other places. Um, be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. And then verse 12, for if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. But they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. Now, as they did the very things that God told them not to do, the very things that God said would happen to them, happened to them. Nobody at any point in their disobedience could say to the Lord, we didn't know. No one will ever be able to say to him, now or on the judgment day, Lord, we didn't know. Because his warnings have been communicated clearly to us. We see it also in verses 15 through 16. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. And verse 16 on also. But we see it in the New Testament. Because there are a lot of people who will say, well, that's the way God worked in the Old Testament. Or, Pastor, that's Old Testament. I'm a New Testament Christian. Listen, if you're a Christian, you need to be a person of the book, Old and New Testament. Paul tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. All of it. From Genesis through Revelation, we don't have the option of picking and choosing the books that are suitable for our own context. It's all God's word. And so in Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 9, for example, the Lord Jesus says unequivocally, and I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. There are few things in this world that make me shudder more than to hear the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, tell me that there is something that cannot be forgiven. Because my whole life is banked on the assurance of God's forgiveness. That my sins are forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ. That I have yielded my life to him in repentance and faith. But to think that one would blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that one would ultimately reject that which the Spirit himself reveals, that in rejecting the Son of God himself, rejecting the Word of God that the Holy Spirit has inspired, by blaspheming the Spirit, we consign ourselves to an eternity of wrath. I don't know what scares you. There are a lot of things that can scare you. Driving on Tamiami Trail is frightening. Try it on a motorcycle sometime. Just helps remind me whether I still have faith or not. Just getting out there among the traffic and saying, Lord, you, you truly are all that's standing between me and eternity. But something that's frightening to consider that we would take the holy word of God and reject it and fling it back in God's face and blaspheme the spirit who has inspired it and go to eternity without forgiveness 
I cannot for the life of me think of anything more frightening than that. But thanks be to God that the Lord Jesus Christ has warned us. He has warned us so that we don't have to go down that path, that we might yield to him and say, no, Lord, I believe and I trust in you. And, of course, John in the Revelation at the, at the last chapter of the Bible warns us, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. I'm not going to read all those plagues. I just refer you to them. You don't want that to happen to you. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Warnings. Now, again, you can rationalize that away, as many do, and say, well, that's just the ranting of a backwoods Bible-thumping preacher. I grew up spending a lot of time in the backwoods. There's no question. And I'm up here, and I've got a Bible. I'll even thump it for you. I did not write one word in this book. I am not making this up. I am simply trying to read and report to you faithfully what God has lovingly imparted to us for our benefit. And for our sakes, God has given the Lord Jesus Christ because he loves you. He has warned us in the scriptures to trust in the Lord Jesus. He's warned us that if we reject the Lord Jesus, there will not be forgiveness. He's warned us because he loves us. And so today, we are able to come and to consider what happened long ago under the leadership of Joshua and realize that People come and go, circumstances change, but God's word stands forever and that the Lord Jesus Christ remains now as he has the Savior of sinners. I've already made reference to it, but, you know, we can be thankful that we're meeting here, that literally the bombs are not falling outside, that missiles are not hurtling into buildings, and bullets are not being fired at us. Our children's hospitals are not being attacked by a nefarious enemy this morning, even though it's happening in the Ukraine. But we also know that those things and much worse could befall us. And if they don't, and I pray they don't, even so, death will come. I pray it's peacefully for you. I prayed more than once God would take me in my sleep. I don't have the option of choosing the way that he's going to take me, but I can ask. Even so, the end will come. And I'm thankful that God has graciously revealed to us these matters of life and death so that we may confidently face the end. I can well remember taking the hand of a World War II veteran who had been through that horrendous battle of Iwo Jima as he was a part of the 5th Marine Division, who had gone ashore at Red Beach at zero hour, and he saw more horrendous things than I can even begin to describe. He shared things with me, and he told me, he said, please don't ever tell my family. And as I took his hand, as he was beginning to breathe his last, and I said, um, Grady, let me pray. He looked at me and he said, don't you pray that I'll be healed. He said, I'm going to heaven and I'm ready to go. I wanted to say, way to go, Marine. Hoorah. <laughs> the end will come for each of us because the Bible has said it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. God didn't mince words. He's told us clearly. Know today that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. That you can confidently say at the end, whether it's today or years from now, I'm ready. We go now. May God bless you to have that confidence. In Jesus, now and always. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are the great and mighty one. 
And we ask you, O Lord, in this place of peace today, that you may grant to us grace that there may truly be peace in our hearts with you through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Lord, we pray that peace will come to those places in the world now being ravaged by war and terrorism and violence of every kind. Our hearts are broken as we think of children and men and women of every age and walk of life having to face the horrors of a depraved and wicked humanity. Oh, Father, open our eyes to the glory and majesty of Jesus that we may flee to the one who is our refuge, that we may find ourselves hidden in the cleft of the rock, that we may trust in Christ alone, that we may be the church in this world. That, Father, whatever opposition or persecution may arise, may we be faithful to follow your word that is not diminished in the slightest by the passing of time. Neither is your glory diminished just because men would selfishly and sinfully turn away from you. Grant that we may live every day for your glory and long for the moment that we will see you in glory. For Jesus' sake, amen. As we conclude, I invite you to take your song sheets or otherwise look to the screens. We're going to sing Trust and Obey, and we're going to sing the first, fourth, and fifth stanzas. So we're not going to sing everything that's there on your pages, but we're going to sing stanzas one, four, and five. Let's stand as we do it, as we worship the Lord. Just to mention to you in closing, if you're intimidating by registering online for that upcoming conference that will be held here on the 18th, just let us know you're planning to come. You can call the office or speak to me or just let us know. We'll make sure that you have a reservation and we'll worry about the $15 later. But I know some people have had trouble registering and I don't want that to be an impediment to you. So please let us know if you plan to come and we'll make sure there's a chair here for you. Westminster Seminary didn't give me the authority to say that. I just did. In the meantime, may the Lord bless you. Receive his benediction as we think about those today who long for peace. May you know the peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. 
And so may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.